into week five of an introduction to the archaeology of architecture. This week we're looking at our third and final case study, the Hagia Sophia in the city of Istanbul. So in terms of learning objectives, it's similar to our previous two case studies. I want you to understand the geographical context and the historical context. And then we're going to discuss the idea of the palimpsest a lot this week, um, as well as touch on the three Fs. But this week especially, I just want you to be thinking about the three Fs yourself as I go over the historical context, because I'm not necessarily going to, you know, pinpoint exact things for you this week. I, ahead of the uh, final assignment, I want you to sort of think about it yourself this week. And, you know, not just thinking about what defines architecture, but how do you define architecture. And thinking about architecture as more than just a physical space, is what happened to the architecture just as important as what happened within the architecture? And especially with the Hagia Sophia, does every F change when it comes to religion? So these are, you know, thinking about as I go through the historical context in a minute here, you know, so in what ways does the form change? In what ways does the function change? And with both of these, it's not just, you know, the building in general, but how individual spaces are being repurposed. And then finally, feeling. Does religion change the way a space makes people feel on an individual level? Or is this just kind of a general uh, consensus of feeling? But And how does this play out in a converted space? Especially when that converted space may you know, be used as a political statement beyond just religion. Uh, so first we're going to touch on geographical context. So Istanbul, uh, or the modern city of Istanbul, is located in, I think, one of the most important junctions in this area of the world. And like Athens, it's located in the eastern Mediterranean region. However, it's at a very important junction between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. And we're going to get into that in the next slide here. But before we do, again, more, more things I want you to think about as we go forward here. I want you to think about how a building's landscape may influence the nature of its construction. So again, thinking about the Acropolis and the Parthenon, you know, how the Acropolis itself was used to amplify the architecture, and thinking about the Gigantia Temple, how it amplified its own landscape. And this is the same case with the Hagia Sophia, which is located on the Bosphorus. So the Bosphorus etymology etymologically uh, comes from the words meaning cattle passage <laughs> uh, as it's associated with the myth of Io. And this has been a very important junction from ancient times and it continues to be to this day. It controls access to the Black Sea via the Sea of Marmara and the Mediterranean. It straddles Europe and Asia and the modern city of Istanbul is actually located like on both continents geographically. So the core ancient city of Byzantium slash Constantinople slash Istanbul is located on the peninsula I've highlighted in red on the slide here. So not only is it located on a major trade route, but also it's a very defensible piece of land with a decent harbor, that being the Golden Horn to the north of the peninsula. And obviously all of these factors have given this area of the world a very long and a very rich history. However, it has made it a target for occupation because controlling this area obviously gives one a lot of power. So it was originally founded as a Greek trading settlement called Byzantium uh, in an unknown year. No one really knows exactly when that occurred. Uh, and that's actually where the Byzantine Empire gets its name, was from Byzantium. But it really did not have much of a role on the global or historical stage until it was named the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire by the Emperor Constantine in 330 CE. So roughly two centuries uh, before the Hagia Sophia was built. Uh, today it's the modern Turkish city of Istanbul, which uh, the name Istanbul actually comes from the phrase Estan Polin, which means in the city in Greek. I just thought that was a really cool fun fact. And again, you guys know I really like etymology, so get to throw it in when I can. <laughs> and I wanted to include also talking about the Bosphorus, this photo of the Hagia Sophia as it appears from the water. So as you can tell, it's a very prominent building and it would have been highly visible in ancient times and medieval times as it is today. 
And again, going off of this idea of landscape, I just um, asked you about in the last slide, does geographical location of a city on you know, these important trade routes in these prominent positions affect the way the city appears to passersby? And should it affect that? You know, is recognition important, especially when associated with religion, but also does feeling matter beyond religion? So, you know, someone of the Christian faith, uh, when this was a Christian church, would have seen the Hagia Sophia and, you know, been awestruck by, like, you know, the amazing power of God and this amazing church. But then, you know, someone of a different religion may approach this and have a similar feeling, you know. It, it's all, again, down to the individual, but again, thinking about the way that the landscape directly affects how the architecture is supposed to make one feel, not just upon approach, but just as part of a landscape. So the Hagia Sophia was finished in 537 CE after only five years of construction. And just for reference, this is about a thousand years after the Parthenon was built. Its name comes from the Greek words meaning holy wisdom. And it was constructed under the rule of the Emperor Justinian, who ruled over the Byzantine Empire, or at that time it was called the Eastern Roman Empire. So why was it called the Eastern Roman Empire? So a couple of centuries before this, uh, the Emperor Diocletian split the Roman Empire in two in the third century CE uh, between the East and the West. And as I mentioned, the Emperor Constantine named Constantinople his capital in the East a few decades after this in 330 CE, and the Hagia Sophia was built 200 years after that. The Eastern Roman Empire used Greek as its primary language over Latin in comparison to the West, and as a political body, it continued to exist for nearly a millennium uh, beyond the so-called, uh, you know, fall of Rome in the West in the 5th century CE. Now, architecturally, the Hagia Sophia sort of saw the onset of a new architectural style. At its core, the church is a basilica. And a basilica was a form of public architecture used in the pagan Roman Empire for centuries before this, and it was actually adopted by early Christians uh, into a space of worship in the 4th century CE. Uh, notable uh, structures would include St. Peter's Basilica, uh, the original St. Peter's Basilica, not the one you see today. However, the dome is a new feature, as most basilicas had a pitched roof uh, up until that point. And through trial and error, <laughs> and this included the construction of the buttresses and the flanking half domes you see here in this detail photo on the slide, uh, the dome introduced a new use of light and a new use of space in a religious setting. One account even states that it was as if the ceiling was being held up by God himself. Uh, the dome itself collapsed a few times over the course of its history, but, and this was usually during an earthquake, uh, but for the most part, structurally, it is the same dome that was rebuilt in 553 CE after the first dome failed. Now, I won't get into the intricacies of early Christianity. <laughs> Again, that could be its own course, uh, but I just want you to kind of understand that the structure was initially built as a Christian church, and that was the initial uh, intention behind the space. So it was used for things such as emperor crowning, similar to um, how other cathedrals in Europe are used today, as well as the regular uh, religious services as well. It saw multiple forms of Christianity, uh, including iconoclasm, Eastern Orthodoxy, and it was even used as a Roman Catholic cathedral for a few decades uh, when Western Latin forces took over the city for a little while, uh, but Byzantine forces took it back in 1261. Uh, so it resumed being <laughs> under the Byzantine Empire at that point. The architecture itself set a precedent for later Byzantine and actually disorthodox churches in general, uh, which for the most part, up until this day, are still modeled after the design of the Hagia Sophia, uh, except usually on a smaller scale, and the artistic style obviously has changed over time as well, but at its core, orthodoxy, uh, owes its style to the Hagia Sophia. Now, the next notable phase in the Hagia Sophia's existence uh, occurred in 1453 CE, over 900 years after the Hagia Sophia was initially built. Uh, the Ottomans succeeded in taking Constantinople. 
It was not their first attempt at occupation, but it was their first successful one. And it was under Mehmed II and his use of cannons in the siege, which ultimately broke the famous impenetrable walls, uh, that the Hagia Sophia was converted into a mosque. It was the most magnificent building in the city at that time, and obviously it was only appropriate that it became the primary place of worship for the new rulers of the city and the religion that they practiced. Now, architecturally, for the most part, the structure actually stayed the same. Of course, the Christian fittings and the art uh, were covered up with whitewash. Um, a minaret was constructed outside, and a minaret is the tower you usually see outside a mosque, which is used uh, for the call to prayer. And the minarets you see uh, to this day, the four prominent ones that make up kind of the that iconic image of the Hagia Sophia, uh, weren't built actually until the 16th century. So they were built about a century after uh, the initial takeover and conversion. And then inside, as you can see on this photo, uh, they in, uh, installed a mirab and a minbar uh, in the area that was formerly the absent altar of the Christian church. And a mirab on the left in this image is the niche that indicates the direction of Mecca for prayer. And the minbar is uh, the staircase on which the mosque's preacher would stand. In fact, uh, in a similar fashion to their Christian predecessors, uh, the Hagia Sophia was used as a seat for sultans uh, up until the 20th century. So after the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire after World War I, uh, it was replaced by the Republic of Turkey in 1923, and it was Mustafa Kemal Ataturk uh, who closed the Hagia Sophia uh, as a functioning mosque in 1931, and in 1935, it was reopened to the public as a museum. Now, this was, I think, the most important phase uh, in the Hagia Sophia's history, but that's coming from an archaeological standpoint. Uh, this is because it was, they kept the elements of the mosque, and they also tried, they also tried to reveal as many features of the Christian church as well in the midst of creating this museum, this building as a museum, <laughs> which I think is just such an interesting uh, phase in any building's history. So the mosaics, as I mentioned before, uh, they were covered up, whitewashed mostly, and this actually uh, preserved them to a certain degree. And starting in the 1930s, the Byzantine Institute of America slowly unveiled them, and they were included in the museum, and work obviously still continued on them up until 2020. And they are obviously, as you can see by this detail here, absolutely gorgeous, priceless pieces of art uh, on par with all the pieces of art that you find in the Hagia Sophia, including the calligraphic uh, roundels uh, that flank the apse there, as well as the mirab and the minbar, absolutely gorgeous pieces uh, that have been preserved in this building. Now, conceptually, I think the Hagia Sophia encompasses this idea of the palimpsest really, really well. As we saw with the Parthenon, large pieces of its palimpsest are now missing from the archaeological record, but we know from accounts that the various faces it took over the course of its history. The Hagia Sophia, on the other hand, exists within every phase of its palimpsest. So its state of preservation is absolutely incredible, and this, for the most part, is mixed with sheer dumb luck, and as well as the fact that the space has been so well respected through its various phases um, over the course of its history. And not every building in the archaeological record, as we saw with the Parthenon, is this lucky and provides us with this much insight, not only into its individual history, but the history of everyone who came into contact with it over time. Going off of that, one of my favorite pieces of trivia in regards to the Hagia Sophia is this piece of runic graffiti uh, from the 9th century CE. So for years, it was considered sacred. It's carved into one of the marble balustrades on one of the upper levels that looks down into the primary space. And it wasn't until it was genuinely examined and translated that it was found to actually say, half Dan was here or half Dan carved this. And I think this is the sort of thing that really encompasses the importance of buildings in the archeological record. So 
you know, just as artifacts can pass through many, many hands and end up in different places, buildings and structures have had other people and things pass through them. And sometimes, like our friend Half Dan here, they leave a piece of themselves behind. So buildings have this absolutely incredible ability to conserve pieces of history and act as a palimpsest of time as the history around it changes, as the various context in which it, it exists changes. It conserves, you know, not just these huge chunks of history uh, that are relevant, you know, overall, but it can it conserves these these small individual pieces, these parts that, you know, conserve the name and the story of someone who may have been lost to history um, otherwise. And it reminds you of kind of the human side of the past and how each individual person and not just empires and kings and elite people shaped the world we live in now. It was people like Half Dan, it was people like you and me who shaped the world we live in now. Now, going into next week a little bit, after being a museum for almost a century, the Hagia Sophia has actually been recently converted back into a mosque, back into a practicing mosque. And so I pose this question to you. Should a religious space be respe respected as such, as a religious space, or should history also be honored? And this is kind of a hot button issue right now, but it's something I want you to think about before we discuss this next week. So here are my sources this week. And this is one of my absolutely favorite photos of the Hagia Sophia. I think it's an absolutely breathtaking space. Uh, it's the acoustics, the light, it's long history just ingrained in the very fabric of the structure. It really encompasses this idea of archaeology and architecture, which I'll get into a little bit next week. But again, just something I want you thinking about before we head into next week. Now, we are going to have a short quiz this week, uh, but I want you to start thinking about your final assignment because it's going to involve this sense of the individual, of understanding where you are now and the places that surround you every day and the architecture you come into contact with every day. So, you know, some things to think about. Where have you left pieces of yourself over time? How many buildings have you walked in and out of? Uh, that building, that space, you know, is now a part of you. Uh, one thing I like to think about is schools, for example. So I will probably never set foot in my one of my primary schools ever again. Yet there is a photo of me and the rest of my graduating class in one of the hallways that I went up and down every single day. You know, my name is on a little plaque from 2009 where the names of, you know, all these other students who won this specific award uh, are also ingrained. So that plaque in itself is a palimpsest just as much as, you know, a building is a palimpsest. So like I said about archaeology being a puzzle with, you know, missing pieces and other pieces mixed in, that's heritage. It's, you know, forming our own version of the present and where that present came from, I think is so, so important to understand. But uh, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. If you need any clarification or more information regarding uh, the final assignment, I'm happy to talk to you about it, but I will be posting about it next week along with a rubric. And next week's lecture is going to be about our modern world, uh, including the issues of tourism, conservation, and religion, which I've kind of touched on as we've gone through these case studies already. And if you have any examples you would like me to touch on uh, that I haven't touched on in this course yet, uh, please do let me know. I'm going to post uh, something about that next Monday. Uh, but have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.